The lunar modules, the vessels that all lunar landings used as base camp, where astronauts ate, slept, and got ready for their day on a whole other world. The landing sites and descent stage of the LMs are still there, but the vessels that actually housed humans and the controls they used to both land and take off from the moon are gone. See, after landing on the moon and doing whatever it is you do on the moon, Apollo astronauts lifted off and docked with the command module for the trip back home. The lunar modules were then jettisoned and commanded to impact the moon. Why would NASA crash the modern-day equivalents of the Santa Maria, the HMS Endeavor, or Shackleton's Endurance? For science, of course! Each Apollo mission had set up seismometers to study the interior of the moon via vibrations from meteorites and crashing spacecraft. Through these experiments, researchers found that the moon had a solid core surrounded by a liquid and partial melted core. Aside from impact signals, the seismometers detected the moon actually has Earthquakes, well, not earthquakes, but, you know, moonquakes caused by tectonic action and tidal forces from Earth's gravity. Indeed, all this science led to the understanding that the moon's interior is way more dynamic than the anticipated. But that's not why we're here. We want to see those lunar module impact sites. For 40 years, no one knew exactly where these crash sites were. The impact craters were thought to be at least... 30 meters wide, but there was no lunar imagery that could resolve smaller than just a few kilometers. Then, in 2009, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was launched carrying cameras that could resolve the lunar surface as close as half a meter per pixel, roughly one and a half feet per dot. When the LRO team searched for the crash sites, they had an idea of where to look, but not exactly what the craters would look like. They knew what a crater from the third stage of a Saturn V rocket looked like, also known as the S-4Bs. Sharp edges, a nearly geometric crater with visible shock zones where lunar dust had been blown away on impact. They also knew what a crater from smaller craft like the Ranger probes looked like. In the early 1960s, these probes were the first to photograph the moon's surface up close. However, in their search for the lunar modules, the LRO team only found this, a vast landscape of indistinguishable craters. What makes the lunar module impact sites difficult to spot are twofold. One, the S-4Bs and the Ranger probes hit the moon at a high vertical angle, some almost straight on at 79 degrees. The lunar modules, however, hit the moon under a 5 degree angle. One impact was as low as 1 degree. So when they hit, it was just a glancing blow. Secondly, to conserve weight, the hull of the lunar modules had to be as thin as possible. Now mix that with a pressurized cabin, and you got yourself a space balloon. Once the bottom of the LM was ruptured, the rest of the craft burst upward, outward, in a forward motion. There would be little to no detectable crater, and debris would be cast in a thin linear fan. Even with a maximum resolution of 0.5 meters per pixel, Finding something that small and faint would be close to impossible. As strange as it sounds, these difficult factors actually led to the discovery of the LM crash sites by two independent researchers. We interviewed Dr. Philip Stuck from the Center of Planetary Science and Exploration at the University of Western Ontario, who co-discovered the lunar module crash sites of Apollo 12, 14, 15, and 17. He, along with amateur astronomer Michael Marcus, a.k.a. Gonda Plaid, figured that the LMs didn't leave a typical crater, but rather deep gouges and small debris field. The crash sites of the Ranger probes and, and uh, the uh, upper stage rockets for Apollo, the Saturn 4Bs, um, their craters look like typical craters made by, uh, you know, little meteorites and things that have smashed into the moon. The reason they, they look like that is just that they came down almost vertically. They hit the moon at a pretty steep angle coming down and smashing into the surface. The things that were in orbit and have dropped out of orbit, they come down at a very, very shallow grazing angle and they kind of, they hit the surface and you could imagine them sort of uh, digging a kind of a gouge in the surface as they push through it. It's a different geometry, so the craters are going to look different. Um, and it's because they look different, very, very unlike most lunar craters that, that, that we have a chance of finding them. 
What you're seeing here is the debris field from Apollo 12's lunar module, the Intrepid. It stretches along the moon's surface for over three kilometers and was found after amateur astronomer Michael Marcus noticed an error in the Apollo 12's mission report. If you look at the image in the mission report, and you, <laughs> you have to not just glance at it, but really look very carefully, you can actually see the landing ellipse, which was the, the target area for the landing, and they actually landed within that. It's actually marked on that map, but it's very, very faint. Uh, and then you look at where they, on that graphic, they say the landing site is, and it's off to the side a bit. Uh, and so what uh, Michael has done and what I did uh, independently, basically you, you take their trajectory and uh, their marked landing site and you move it to where the actual ellipse uh, is, and that gives you your new location for it. There was just a mistake. I, I think probably they had the base map and then they had an overlay on a transparent acetate sheet and they put it over it, but, they, but it slipped a bit before they photographed it. I think that's what they did. If we follow the debris field, it seems to originate here, but with no point of impact. Even though most of the craft would have been blown away from the point of impact, there should be a discernible burst of debris that affected the immediate terrain. I, I was very intrigued by the, these little uh, dark streaks, the sort of field of little dark streaks. Very intrigued by it, uh, excited by it. Yeah, I, I thought, uh, you know, I think I might have it here. But um, it wasn't exactly the impact site. But for, from the orientation of them, you could sort of tell that the impact site ought to be uh, off uh, to one end of that. Uh, I went looking for it, but I didn't find it initially. Backtracking the LM's projected path, they found a long gouge followed by an immediate burst of debris that affected local craters. The only thing needed was to prove that these two features were related. Now, this was Intrepid's projected descent path, and its angle of descent was 3.7 degrees. Using topographical data from the Grail spacecraft, Michael Marcus showed the angle from the point of impact to the start of the debris field was also 3.7 degrees. This meant that Intrepid grazed the summit of this hill, broke apart, and the debris came to rest on the opposite slope. I think for Apollo 12, possibly something like a projecting antenna hit the surface before anything else did, uh, and that set it into a catastrophic rotation. Just, you know, I mean, you're hitting it two kilometers a second, you go into a catastrophic rotation, so bits get flung off and continue downrange. The duo also found Apollo 14's Antares, which hit a small hillside. You can see here the gouge it made as it impacted the surface at a 3.6 degree angle. The Antares didn't produce a long streak of debris because everything went straight into this slope. Apollo 15's Falcon crash site produced a long groove as it grazed the surface at 3.2 degrees. But the debris didn't go far, since here too was an uphill slope. Apollo 17's Challenger impacted right into the mountainside. It produced the only crater made by a lunar module. The angle of inclination relative to the surface is 38 degrees, much higher than any other LM. The crater is hard to see, but using the LRO's imagery for different times of the day, we can see the crater and its deep grooves. These are all the known Apollo crash sites, but there are three missing from this list. We know that after Apollo 13's service module was damaged by an oxygen tank explosion, the crew used the LM as a lifeboat. After the astronauts transferred back to command module for re-entry, the LM was jettisoned and burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. We also know that the crew of Apollo 16 accidentally skipped a step in their pre-jettison checklist and lost control of the Orion. After jettison, it was last seen slowly tumbling towards the moon. Its final resting place is still unknown. But most notably, we don't know where the crash site of Apollo 11's Eagle is. Turns out, after returning to the command module, the vessel that carried the first humans to the moon was abandoned in decaying orbit. Between one to four months later, it impacted somewhere on the moon. Because the moon has such a lumpy magnetic field, we have little clue to exactly where it hit. Also, yes, I said lumpy. Certain areas of the moon, called mascons, short for mass concentrations, have more pull than others. This made it nearly impossible to predict where the unguided lunar module may have hit. Mascons were known at the time, but were not fully understood. They were first discovered when the Lunar Orbiter satellites, which were sent to photograph potential Apollo landing sites, experienced slight deviations in their orbits. 
It wasn't until 2011 when the Grail satellites mapped the whole gravitational field of the moon that mascons were better understood. It was determined that large meteor strikes in the moon's past created positive gravitational anomalies, meaning these crater basins had more pull than other areas of the moon. So, somewhere out there are the wrecks of Apollo 11 and 16. These sites have great cultural significance for our spacefaring heritage. Some like the Soviet lunar probes and landers were the first human-made objects to reach the moon. One day, it may be another independent researcher or amateur astronomer who finds the missing lunar modules. In fact, recently the lunar module from Apollo 10 was discovered by astronomer Nick Howes, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. Apollo 10 was the only crewed lunar module that survived the Apollo program. Though it never landed on the moon, it did fly just eight miles above the surface. Affectionately called Snoopy, it was only meant to be a dress rehearsal for the Apollo 11 landing. After its mission, Snoopy was jettisoned into a heliocentric orbit, meaning it now orbits the sun. For over 50 years, no one knew where Snoopy ended up. Then in 2019, telescopes from Hawaii, Australia, and Arizona spotted something very small trailing Earth. Labeled as Asteroid 2018 AV2, it matches the same mass, luminosity, speed, and predicted orbit of Apollo 10's lunar module. NASA is really good at making exploration vessels. They're also pretty great at collecting data and putting it out there for the public to use. It's up to the independent researchers and us all to take that data and use it. People like Kevin M. Gill use imagery from the high-rise satellites over Mars to create these amazing landscapes. Normally, we're a sci-fi gaming channel and while there are many video games that explore a version of space, here's our chance to explore our own solar system. All the tools and data are right there for us to explore. Like, here's every photo taken by the Cassini mission. I mean, every single one. These sites are not easy to use, but in coming videos, we hope to show you how to navigate them and find cool stuff, be it on the moon, Mars, or anywhere else in our solar system. We've been Ghost Giraffe. Subscribe for more. For over 50 years, no one knew where Snoopy ended up. Where did that Snoopy go? These are the known Apollo crash sites, but there are three missing from this list. You got yourself a space balloon, partner. <laughs> uh, okay, let me know if I need to do this one again. I'm going to try one more time.